President Muhammad Buhari promises free, fair and credible general elections in 2023 and promises to transfer power to Nigerians peacefully. And the United Kingdom's government refuses to reverse the travel ban over the Nigerian government's threat. Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako. President Muhammad Buhari has assured Nigerians and the international community of free and fair general elections come 2023. He's also promised a peaceful transfer of power. He also assured that necessary mechanisms will be strengthened to ensure that Nigeria witnesses another peaceful transfer of power. He, however, stated that the country's democratic gains of the past decades are under threats of unconstitutional takeover of power. He added that Nigeria continues to face security challenges that pose a threat to democracy and calls on global partners to support our efforts, that's Nigeria's efforts, in tackling insurgency and terrorism. Well, joining us to discuss this is Paul James. He is the program manager, Elections, Yaga Africa. We're also being joined by Obin Chiku. He's a legal practitioner. And Kunle Lawal, who is the executive director, Electoral College of Nigeria. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Great. Paul, I'm going to start with you because, of course, uh, Yaga is not just about um, monitoring elections, but you also do uh, the job of making sure that people are educated daily as to what they need to know in terms of making sure that we have free, fair, and credible elections and our rights as voters. So I'll start with this question. Um, Aside from June 12th, that every Nigerian points to us, you know, uh, the most um, credible elections that we've had since Nigeria became a republic in itself or since we embraced the, the act of democracy or the system of government called a democracy. Has Nigeria, after June 12th, uh, been able to point to a free, fair and credible election other than June 12th? Sure, I think there are some other elections that have passed the credibility pressure have been based on the lessons that Nigeria will want to do elections with. Me, I always want to see election from a holistic point of view, looking at election from uh, three prisons. Uh, one is the idea around inclu inclusivity in election, idea around transparency in election, and also idea around accountability. Oftentimes, we limit election to just the election day. And so people pass that judgment call on whether election is free, fair, transparent, or credible without looking or without necessarily looking at other issues or elements around the elections. Mm -hmm. We have had elections even in recent past whereby human judgment, a lot of people have said, yeah, it has made the integrity threshold or credibility threshold. A case in point is the Edo election and the uh, the Edo and Ondo election that happened in the year 2020. These are also because before the election, there were a lot of apprehension based on what we all saw in the build up to the election. Election day, and this was also an election that happened within the context of the pandemic, something that had never happened uh, in Nigeria. So uh, a, a lot of things had to be put in place uh, for, to make the election happen. For instance, I never had to come up with uh, a guideline to regulate how to conduct election amidst the pandemic. And so we went into that election. Election day, we saw also how INEP introduced technology. And to some extent, that technology also helped to raise the bar in the conduct of election, helped to also uh, bring some sanity uh, to the result collation process. So um, for me, I think is how we want to view those elections. The uh, June 12th election, I accept that level, of, I got that level of acceptance from Nigeria, of course, because we know that was also an election that happens amidst a lot of other issues. And that is also uh, where we're trying to transition from um, a military or a dictatorship to um, a, a civilian government. So um, I think um, we also have to look at them on, on a case by case basis. We want to view the elections. But then if we go back also, and so in the last 20 years since we have had democracy, how has the election fair? How has the conduct of elections fair, for instance? 
One issue that we have constantly grappled with is the issue of uh, election logistics, which we saw also play out in the last Anandra election in November. And so um, once we have made a lot of progress, especially in the in election administration, there are still a bit of challenges here and there. And that is why after every election, you begin to look at what are those aspects of the election that you want to see reform. What are those actual aspects of election that you want to see us do better as we engage the next phase of election? Mm -hmm. And that is why that, that huge clamor for uh, electoral act amendment, uh, which of course, as we know, is before the president for his assent. We got only barely uh, nine days, uh, six days until uh, June, uh, until December 19th, which will give us like a month since it was transmitted to the president by National Assembly for his assent. Whether or not that will happen, we don't know. I heard the, uh, the, the uh, I mean, the opening statement by the president. I mean, the fundamental question to ask is, who was the audience? Who was he speaking to? Was he mm. speaking to or was he speaking to a foreign audience? Um, we see a president. Well, the president was in America. He was attending a democracy uh, forum. I think uh, he was invited by the Secretary of State for that event. So yes. It was not just only speaking to um, the world, but he was speaking to us Nigerians because, I mean, we're the ones who are going to be participating in the elections, aren't we? Sure, but then, uh, for how long are we going to continue in this manner that the president speaks more to, if, uh, to people outside of the country than he speaks to us at Nigeria? This is where we need to do the confidence building ahead of 2023. How okay. many months will we have from now to 2022? Barely 12, 13 months, and then uh, some of the elements that you want to see put in place before the election are not there. For okay. instance, is the INEC, the election management body, fully constituted? We have some positions in INEC that need to be filled, especially the positions of national commissioners. We've got mm -hmm. some people that are tenor type. We've got some people that are, I mean, their, 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 their time of office have elapsed and are no longer there. We're not even talking about that. We'll come, we'll come back to the INEC issue. Let me let me bounce to um, Barista Obina. Barista Obina, he says that we have that we have made progress in over twenty years, and as at today, he thinks that um, we can do better. But judging from June twelfth, let's just use that as a yardstick. We've had other elections, other forms of elections before <coughs> we decided that we're going to adopt a, a democratic system of government. Um, so many pundits have referred to the fact that Nigeria's elections have, over the years, been very dodgy. Um, some of us, some of them say that we have a history of sorts when it comes to elections. Our elections are never really straightforward. Um, and they, they've said that many things have remained the same, even though um, Paul is saying that things have changed. I'm trying to understand. Um, do you agree? Are you of the school of thought that we have had a history of dodgy elections? Or have things been better uh, over time? Okay, uh, first, thank you for having me. I, I want to, I want to whether one will say, will use the word disagree. The, we have not had any election in Nigeria that one can, can keep on so. Even from the June 12th election that uh, people all of a sudden, Nigerians, forgot what uh, transpired during the June 12th election. And uh, everybody is now using June 12th as a springboard or uh, to say that June 12th. Was June 12th really uh, an election, the election conducted the way it should? The answer is no. And you don't just wake up from the blues and you conduct an election. There must be legal framework the legal framework will tell you whether or not that election will be free and fair. All that we have done from 1992 and even in the past have been a host or a horrid kind of arrangement where one president comes in or one head, head of state comes in and the press is, uh, will now interview him. Are you going to hand over? That's not how it should be. How should it the be? Legal how do you think it should it be? Impossible. Hello, what did you say? How do you think it should, what processes do you think should be taken for, for it to actually be referred to as a proper electoral process? That's what I'm saying. That the legal framework must be in a way, must be crafted in a way that makes it even impossible for 
for even a, a president or a head, a head of state to say that he does not want to leave office. Let's take, for instance, what happened in the U.S. in the, in, uh, the 2020 election. You saw how the legal framework in, uh, in America stood the test of time. Even though, uh, as of today, polls still shows that uh, about uh, several millions, so more than 70 million Americans are still disputing the election. But the legal framework had swear. What we have in Nigeria up to today, we are still discussing whether the election will be transmitted, uh, whether it, we will have a central system where election will be transmitted. All what we still have is a haphazard thing. We have not really done, I can tell you, maybe somebody will say, I am maybe predicting gloom and doom and all that. We have not, we are not ready to have elections. What we've been having is a, a political party comes in and the political party at Manufa, the other political parties, and uh, and uh, God people. But that's that but that but that's elected. where we are as a country. So how do you expect um, this change to happen? You're, you're talking about the judicial or the legal framework. This is yes. these elections are conducted as it is in the electoral act. And don't forget that that electoral act, which is now a bill is sitting on Mr. President's table. We cannot change the framework or we cannot go against the framework that we have as a law. So how do we change that? It's in front of our lawmakers. You and I cannot necessarily decide what has to be in that paper. We were not informed to be part of what, you know, that process on the floor of the National Assembly. Yes, we had that thing where the National Assembly members went around different regions and had a, a sit down and they talked about it. But did it really reflect? So again, when we talk about the legal framework, I'm still trying to pick your brain. How do we have a say in how these things are done? Even with the electoral act that we have now, can it change anything? Or is it just us, the people, that are the problem and not necessarily the piece of paper? The ele the ele let me start with the electoral law that we have now. The electoral law that we have now is not uh, any different from what we have, uh, what we have had in the past. It will only still, uh, still at the end of the day, still give or pander towards a political party that has the majority. The only way the citizens. Well, elections are a game of, of numbers. This. It is a game of numbers. So it, the guys yes, with the, the highest that, numbers will win. It's the it same is. thing anywhere in the world, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I agree. But what I'm saying is that. Uh, it is a game, a game of numbers. For the citizens, those numbers that are human beings should first of all pride the nation before selfish interests. Okay. Before their own interests. I'm, I'm going to come course. back to you. Let me come to Kule. Kule, you are of the Electoral College and I've been looking at your facial reactions with all of the, re the responses that are coming. Um, he, on the other hand, is saying that all that we've had over the years has been a sham. He's talking about the fact that if we don't f fix the framework, the legal framework, then we cannot really expect magic to happen. But we do have a legal framework. We have something, especially that which is on Mr. President's table. We all, you were here the last time we had the row over the e-transmission of results. So really, what is the problem? If he's saying we don't have one, Paul is saying, well, we have had changes. We're getting better and we can only get better. Where do you stand in all of this? Well, um, I'd like to come from a different um, perspective. First and foremost, every democracy thrives because it is participatory. Okay. It's the first layer. Now, if you look at Nigerian elections, from 2015, we've had less than 50% of the voting, that's registered voting population participating in elections. 2019 was so bad that you have 84 million registered voters and you now have, have 28 million registered voters participating in an election. This is bad. If you want to lift the level of how the Electoral Act functions, we have to be able to demand this from our lawmakers. But how can we demand it when the population is massively politically illiterate? Politics is not emotional. You see, we take emotional stands on how things are, are going. For a country, 
with the problems we've had. We've made genuine progress as regards our elections. You can look at America. I think women started voting in 1960, which is more than America at 200 and something. Uh, people that didn't have massive wealth started voting too, sometime around women to allow, uh, be, uh, be voting at the same time. So Nigeria's problem, one, participatory. Two, we need to understand what exactly we are we are demanding from our gov and the truth is, from our government and the truth is we can't understand these things if we we can't demand if we don't understand so the electoral act has some flaws yes we always complain about the monetary fact of elections but their campaign their campaign limits within the electoral act we do not call our politicians to to um the table we do not call our politicians and say this will not be tolerated by the people. We don't do that. And instead, we are the ones actually... Should we be doing that when there are laws already that negate these actions? The thing is that laws in a country do not stand up and act if the people do not demand those laws to function. Agreed, agreed. So if we generally think, um, I just decided today, May is deciding to run for office in Lagos. And then next thing I say is, oh, May, yeah, that means you are, you are declaring for us this afternoon, you are buying us lunch. That's our general thought process when somebody is running for office. So we created the buffet of corruption, which we call politics, which is why we don't get anywhere with it. Now, trying to get people involved, because you're talking about participation here, and you talked about, you've showed the decline in the, in the space of four years and people not being interested anymore. Now, the average person you talk to, in terms of getting involved in the elections, they say whether I vote or not, um, it doesn't really matter. Things keep declining. Whether you push and you shove, it still doesn't change anything. So there's that um, resigned mindset already. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so how do you even get the person out of that mindset? Even the, even the second class, even the guys who you think should know, are also part of that particular you, you know, know you know what people. we need to understand in this country and i'm not saying this is what is obtainable but this is how it will work if you want to rig an election you will need someone not to come to an election for you to use this card to do something else if we can get this into our mindset then we might understand how elections are rigged and try to cut it down to the minimum so if i came to the ballot regardless of who i'm voting for it means my card cannot be used to appropriate some kind of misdemeanor. But if I sat at home and said, you know what, this election is not going to work, it's not sensible, it's not even credible, you have crucified a system you don't even understand. And I sit down at home, and then you look at it, okay, card number, this, this, this didn't come to the polling station, but it's within this word. Ah, let's make it look like the person voted and then put it here. So you are even facilitating the fact that frauds are committed during elections. So we keep talking about people not being educated about these things, people not being... Most people do know. They know that whether you vote or not, you have made a choice one way or the other. And then there are people who don't even know. The people that you think do not know, the people that you think are uneducated, are the ones who actually file out in their numbers to vote. And I keep asking everybody, and I'm asking this question to you, Paul, I'm asking this question to you, Barry Salbina, why is it that those of us who complain the most, those of us who think or seem to be the ones who should be knowledgeable about these things, are the ones who sit at home and watch the elections play out on TV? Let me explain something. We normally assume being politically illiterate is commensurate to the education we have. That is wrong. Political literacy does not have anything to do with education. It has to do with understanding the way the system in politics works. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, you have more people that are party members at the grassroots. I can tell you the average middle class citizen, and middle class here does not mean middle class based on um, economics, or middle class based on political middle class, which means you've been to a university or a secondary school. I can tell you that if we point to the room, they don't know their local government chairman, they're not part of a political party, and they can't even name up to three political parties out of the 18 that are functional in Nigeria. Well, that's sad. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Paul. There are very many factors that have been named over time as factors that impede and you know, do not allow for us to have free, fair, and credible elections. We're talking about money politics, like he's mentioned. We're talking about um, um, violence, um, ballot box snatching. It, it sounds like something that is, is in the Stone Age, but it keeps happening in Nigeria, a country that should be 
uh, in the forefront of, I mean, yes, um, we no longer are a third world country. We are a developing country, but this is still happening in the 21st century. Uh, and several other issues, you know, people not joining political parties because they say, uh, you know, politics is dirty. Just to buy to some of the things that Kunle has said, as Yaga Africa, as a Nigerian who's been trying to work on the mindsets of people, do you think that we've been able to at least scratch the surface of people being politically educated and not waiting for the NOA when it's few weeks to the elections? So I, I think uh, Kunle has succinctly captured it all. The wheels of democracy for me are about inclusion and also participation, these two things. Uh, these two key things. Now, I was in uh, Zambia for the elections back in August, and I met a voter that traveled for 600 kilometers to come and participate in the election. They don't have the opportunity like we do in Nigeria for transfer of voting, and so he had to travel to come and vote because he understands the power of his vote. I also just re I returned from the election that was conducted in the Gambia. The election happened on the 4th of December. Where turnout for the election was 89 percent, 89 percent turnout for the election. And so for me, I keep asking myself, what are those lessons to learn from this election? Each time we keep hearing about the political alternatives that they are not what people want, we keep hearing things like the devil and the deep blue sea. But then the challenge has been always around the culture of participation. Participation has been very low, has been very poor. I agree that political education is also poor, but then it also starts from the person, it starts from the mindset. If the options that are there, I mean, if the options that are available are not what people desire, it's mm. a democracy. People have the opportunity to also bring up who they think they desire. So, and again, because we have left this engagement, this engagement has been reduced to episodic engagement. 2023 will not start in February 2023. It started in 2019. But most often we wait until the eve of the election or the month of the election before we begin to hear about these political preparations. There are opportunities that are prevented to people, for instance, voter registration is ongoing. How many people are engaging the process? This has started since July of this year. Ask INEC today and see only about a million Nigerians have, have uh, registered and have collected their, their, I mean, are in the process of collecting their PVC. An average election happened in last August. About 120 something persons registered for the election. Uh, after cleanup, up, 77,000 new registered, uh, registered uh, voters were added to the, uh, to the, to the voters list. But this is a state that has over 5 million people in, uh, that inhabit the state. So I think it starts from even that mindset change. If the options are available, like I said, I know what people desire. Democracy presents them the opportunity to even come up once they organize and they organize well. They can even set up their political parties and come up with that person that they, they think. Oh, best. please don't get me started with the political parties and the numbers. I don't even want, that's a whole kettle of fish on its own. The, num the numbers keep growing, but we don't see the participation. But let me come to you, Baris Albin, now. Um, there are those who are of the school of thought that um, these political parties and the elites in those parties um, are deliberately keeping the electorate in the dark. And, and again, the people themselves, um, this is a school of thought, saying that the people themselves also have resigned to some form of fate. And, and then that's the major problem of participation in the country. Uh, that's one. Secondly, uh, why do you think that many Nigerians are more... Um, averse to joining political parties as opposed to just showing up on election day to cast their votes? Yes. Um, <clears throat> number one, I think the, your statement, I, I think that you are right. The problem with the uh, participation that my friends uh, have been hammering on is that you cannot have large turnout or the so-called high uh, participation when there is no confidence in the electoral system. There is no confidence. In fact, from the first day the party in power uh, selects a candidate, everybody knows that whichever way the person will win. There is no... Can uh, there is no uh, 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 but, but 2015, but 2015 was a different, was some form of um, a difference. I mean, the, for the first yes. time, yes. Um, the part, the party at the center did not necessarily win the presidency. We saw that 
President Goodluck Jonathan, yes. uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan, 20, stepped down and lost the elections. Yes, 2015. 2015 happened because there was an attempt. There was an attempt to have credible elections. Number one, card readers were introduced. Secondly, the chairman of INEC that was appointed, as at that time, I can tell you, somehow was a political. He didn't pander to any political party. And again, the, uh, the Justice Ways uh, 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 report, commission's report, also came. The then president was trying to some, somewhat implement that. So uh, let me go back to voter turnout. You will not have that desired voter turnout when there is no credibility in our electoral process. Secondly, where is the fault? So, if the credibility the, of the electoral process is where I'm at now, because that's what the president is promising Nigerians. He's saying that he, he he's promising that there's going to be a peaceful transfer of power to whoever wins at the end of the day. He's also saying that we will, he would ensure free, fair, and credible elections. And you're saying that the average voter cannot um, cannot say if the, the the process is credible, and that's why we see the level of voter apathy that we're having. No, but is that the fault uh, of INEC? Is that the fault of political parties? Is it the fault of the people? Or what exactly is will, the problem? Yes, it's, uh, I will not lay the blame on anybody. I will say is uh, everybody should take should share from the blame. One, the government should share from the blame. Uh, uh, who, over time, has promised the people of uh, free and fair and uh, free, fair and credible elections and fail to do so. But again, let's look at, let me just uh, conclude um, um, my position on the low, part, uh, low turnout of uh, citizens' participation. Like I said, when there's no credibility, secondly, have we tried to introduce other method or means of voting. Like. Take, for instance, uh, last year or this year, Big Brother Nigeria that had about three or four means of voting had more than several billions of voters. This uh, type of voting that we must shut down the system every Saturday and now force people to go to vote that we have tried for more than 20 years now. Is it working? Why can't we have elections, elections staggered, where people can walk in, strolling as they go to work, they stroll in and cast their vote and leave? Why can't we try other methods? Mm. How would one uh, use a particular method? You do something and expect to have a different result. You okay. cannot have a different result. Okay. Then another thing again that we must also look at is the way we have monetized politics in Nigeria. Look at the salaries of those people. Look at them. Once you are elected, for instance, as a legislator, I can tell you by the time you serve four years, you would have gathered enough money to get yourself elected in the next election. So, bottom, so bottom line, let's make these offices less attractive financially so that we can have better let's leaders. Let's make the offices less attractive. Okay. Why can't we grade the levels? Okay. Let well, them be at the same level with civil servants. Okay. When you do that, people, there will be less uh, confrontation. People, All right. will, people will reconsider. Okay, because we're almost out of time. Let me let Kunle have the last word here. I think, I think there's something we need to stop doing, and that's comparing Big Brother elections to Nigerian elections. The winner of Big Brother is not the commander-in-chief. I'm not comparing. He's not I'm the commander-in-chief. He's commander talking in about chief. the voting process, how the votes are collated. I, I understand, but you also cannot compare it, and there are reasons why. We're a country, I'll give you an example, Anambra elections. Um, over 5 million people in Anambra. I think only about 200,000, not up to 200,000 participated in the election. Who are you going to hold? A credible election is not judged by the number of people that come out. Our next job is to ensure that whoever's vote that is cast is as is when collated. That's credibility. Particip uh, participation, poor participation is because simply we are not keyed into political parties. So I'll give you an example. 
the average Nigerian knows what goes on within the Democratic Party in the U.S., knows what goes on within the Republican Party in the U.S., yet we do not understand what goes on in any party primaries, including Could it be maybe because two. we don't know that they, because they don't have ideologies now, and we do not know they what they stand ideology. for? That, do they? That they What's don't the ideology have, of that the PDP and the APC? That the, uh, PDP is actually more a capitalist party and then APC is actually more, you would say, like uh, so, a overnight, so overnight, so like overnight for example, Governor Ben Ayadi of Cross River State realizes that he is no longer a capitalist and he wants to join the APC. Is that what you're saying? The truth is that I'm sure. Um, I'm, this is I'm the sure, person no, I'm going, going, to, I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer this. I'm sure His Excellency has not read the constitution of his political party. And I'm going to be firm about this. And that's the problem in Nigeria. If we had an influx, a massive influx into political parties, we'd be more concerned about elections that go on in Nigeria. If we had a critical mass ensuring that political parties uh, uh, bring out credible candidates. So bottom the line, the politicians and the elites in the different political parties are politically literate and that's why they keep cross capiting from party to one party to the other. I'll tell you, the average Nigerian is politically illiterate. I'll tell you, because most of them don't even know their functions. Even those serving in office do not know their functions okay. in the National Assembly or elsewhere. Well, on that note, I want to say thank you to all our guests. Thank you very much, Barstow Binna, Paul James of Yaga, and of course, uh, Kunle uh, Lao, who is of the Electoral College Nigeria. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this has to be an ongoing conversation, but thank you all for staying with us. When we return, we'll be discussing the travel ban controversy surrounding Nigeria, the UK, and other countries. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs>